Well, it was almost 29 years ago when something happened in my life where it forced me to take on something more than what I normally would do and that is, I'm talking about responsibility. Learning to take on responsibility in a way that I hadn't had to in the past. I was the, I am the youngest in our family and I have older siblings to take care of things. I have my parents to take care of things. And if you are an oldest child, you know how frustrating it is because you've had to take responsibility and the youngest child wasn't always that responsible. That's usually the way it goes. I was one of the irresponsible ones. I didn't feel the need to be responsible. I was happy, go lucky child and I had lots of fun and lots of, uh, you know, just, just really enjoyed my childhood. And then I got married. <laughs> now don't get me wrong. I'm very, very happy to be married, but there was something that changed drastically when I became married, and that was I had to be responsible. And uh, there was somebody else that I had to look after, somebody's wishes and needs that I had to, to pay attention to. Because mostly it was all about me, and then I got married. And it became much more of an issue to look after somebody else. And, uh, and of course, I had to find a place to live. I had to be responsible with my finances to pay for rent and utilities and uh, to pay for the car, get and travel around. And I discovered th gifts that my wife had that I didn't know she had before, and that was shopping and you know, all the things that go along with that, paying off the MasterCard and so on. And so it, it, was, it was a big responsibility to be responsible. And that's what I had to learn. And, and it just seemed to get worse. Because then we started having kids. <laughs> and they're, they're incredibly needy, these tiny human beings. They just require so much time and energy and you have to get up in the middle of the night to look after them. And of course, my wife did most of that, but anyways. <laughs> and then of course, uh, in my role as pastor, I mean, the demand seemed to increase and problems at church seemed to get more complex and, and the world became more scary and, and there was all kinds of things that were happening that seemed to surround me with this whole sense of, of stress. Because with that great deal of responsibility also came along that, that kind of uh, aspect of, of stress in my life. A few years after that I started to get issues with my stomach. I had to drink some concoction that was supposed to help my stomach get a little bit calmer. And eventually I got to a place where I wasn't able to sleep through the night. I was waking up at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning and, and thinking about all the things that had to be done or concerns in our family or concerns in the church. And, and uh, it became a, a really difficult thing. And then, of course, as a pastor, I know that worrying isn't a good thing. So I started worrying about how much I was worrying, and it really worried me. <laughs> I heard about this uh, guy named Scott, true story, who struggled with anxiety all his life. And, uh, and he tried so many different things to try to deal with his anxiety. And, and he writes this, he says, I had psychotherapy, 30 years of psychotherapy, family therapy, group therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, rational emotive behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, hypnosis, meditation, role playing, interceptive exposure therapy, in vivo exposure therapy, self-help workbooks, massage therapy, prayer, acupuncture, yoga, stoic philosophy, and audio tapes he, off, he bought off a late night talk show. And of course, all the medication that he took too. See if you can recognize any of these medications because they're all over the place. He took things like Thorazine, Imipramine, Desipramine, I'm not sure, I'm butchering the pronunciation, I'm sure. Chlorophenoramine, Nardil, Buspar, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Welbutrin, Effexor, Selexa, Lexapro, Cymbalta, Luvox, Trazodone, Levoxyl, Indurel, Traxine, Cerex, Centrax, St. John's, St. John's Wort, Sopidem, Valium, Librium, Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, not to mention beer, wine, gin, bourbon, vodka, and scotch. That's quite a concoction. And guess what worked? Nothing. 
Now, I don't want to start off with such a discouraging note, but I'm going to have to agree with him that if we try to deal with our anxiety and our stress and our worry in our life with any of these things, they will not cause, they will not deal with the root cause uh, in our life. They might dull some of the symptoms, they may help us cope, uh, they might help us live more in denial, which is sometimes fun for a while, but it will not deal with the root cause. And so today we're going to be starting a series, a new series called Stress Busters. And we're going to try to tackle some of the stresses that we have in our life because one thing we, it seems like we have in common, and that is we all struggle with stresses in our life. We feel under pressure. Sometimes we feel absolutely overwhelmed. And when we feel that way, we don't usually make very good decisions. And we usually have strained relationships as a result because we become impatient and we lash out at others. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the causes and the antidotes to stress. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. We actually sang that song today. Psalm 23. And that's where we're going to find our help. Psalm 23 is one of those love psalms in the Bible. It's a beautiful psalm that really describes for us who God is and his character. And the more we get to know who God is, the more that we find ourselves trusting in him and going to him and allowing him to be the source of our comfort and our peace in our lives. The first cause that we're going to be looking at of, of stress is worry. And we all have pet worries. We worry about finances, our job, our children. Uh, we worry about uh, our marriage and our health. And these are problems that we, that we worry about. But the problem with worry is that it's unhelpful, it's unreasonable, and it's unhealthy. It's unhelpful because it never accomplishes anything. It's like you are, it's like being in a parked car and you're pressing the gas pedal all the way to the floor and it makes all kinds of noise and smoke, but it doesn't go anywhere. The same thing with worry. You make all kinds of noise and smoke, but it doesn't do anything whatsoever for the problems you are facing. And so I remember uh, I've had lots of talks with my dad because he and I have struggled with worry in our life and he has joked around with me saying things like, you know, worry actually does help. He says, I really worried about such, uh, such and such a thing and it never came to pass. See, it worked. <laughs> and he's joking, of course, but only half joking because I think sometimes we actually feel that way. We feel like somehow we, if we just worry enough about it, then maybe we can manipulate the, the situation in order for it to not actually happen. But that's simply not true. We cannot change the past. We cannot control the future. And it just makes us miserable for today. Worry is also unreasonable. It exaggerates the problems. It makes mountains of molehills. It just keeps on making it worse and worse. Sometimes we call this catastrophic thinking when you're mulling over something over and over and over again and you become uh, making this thing turn into a catastrophe when it doesn't need to be. And so uh, to worry about something that you can't change is useless. And to worry about something that you can change is actually stupid because then you just go ahead and change it, right? If you can do that. But either way, worrying doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable. And it's also unhealthy. We are not created to worry. There are all kinds of physical symptoms that we can experience when we worry too much. We can get ulcers and backaches and headaches and insomnia. It affects every major system of our bodies when we worry. Plants and animals don't worry. In fact, everything that God created doesn't worry except for human beings. And we weren't made to worry, and yet we do this all the time, and it makes us unhappy and unhealthy. The old English word for worry is to strangle or to choke. And that's exactly what it, exactly what it does. It strangles the life out of us. Because we were not built for this. Now the interesting thing is that you were not built, you were not born worrying. 
It is a learned behavior. You have learned how to worry over your lifetime. Some of you have become very, very good at it because you've practiced it for a long time. Now the good news about that is we can actually, if we've learned it, we can actually unlearn it and we can deal with it in that way. So what is the antidote to worry? Now I came across this and I thought this makes a lot of sense to me. Stressed spelled backwards is desserts. Now doesn't that make sense? I mean that's kind of how I've dealt with stress is I love desserts and it just seems to unwind, you know, just reverse the stress in my life but then it causes other problems. But uh, that is not the real antidote for, for worry. So let's look at what the real antidote is. And that is to believe that God will take care of you. Believe that he will take care of me. Psalm 23, very first verse, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I have everything I need. And so to believe that, that, that God is going to take care of me, there is no need for me to worry. And, and how does God take care of me? How is it that he is the shepherd of my life? And we, let's just took, take a quick look at what does it mean for a shepherd. Or how does a shepherd take care of a sheep? Well, a shepherd provides. He provides food and shelter and the basic necessities of a sheep. A shepherd protects, defends against enemies and harm. A shepherd guides. He leads sheep when they are confused and they don't know which direction to go. And a shepherd corrects any problems that come your way. A shepherd can come and correct it. So a shepherd provides, protects, guides, and corrects. And this is exactly what the Bible says God does for us. These are the four things that God has promised that he will do for your life if you are trusting in him. If he is your shepherd, he will provide these four things for you. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, it says, God takes care of his people like a shepherd. That's a promise that we have in the Bible. This is how God is going to act, interact in our lives. He will provide, he will protect, he will guide, he will correct. And that's what we have from God, if you let him be your shepherd. He says even more so in Philippians 4, verse 19, it says, My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It says God will meet all of your needs. And he doesn't say that he will meet all of your greeds, by the way. It says that he will meet your needs. If he met everything that you wanted in life, you'd be the most selfish person in the universe. And God knows that that's not the right thing for you. And so he provides for you. He promises to provide for your needs, not for your greeds, not for those things that you want. And God says, I will. He doesn't say, I might, or I might get around to it later on. But he says, I will. That means this is a promise from God. His character is on the line. So either he's going to do it or he's a liar. And so we rest upon the promises that God has given to us. And God says, I will meet all your needs. But what does all mean? Well, that means all. That means your relational needs, your financial needs, your health needs. He will meet all of our needs. And so once we recognize that, what's left to worry about? Nothing. God has taken care of it. When you have an insurance policy on something, do, do you worry about that? No, because you're covered. You know that you don't have to worry about it anymore. Did you know that there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible? That's like life insurance. All the things that you are completely covered because God has promised this in your life. And so when we don't accept those promises, in essence what we are doing, we are, we are taking on a, a posture of, of unbelief. We are practicing an atheistic kind of uh, lifestyle. Functional atheism. Because we are not accepting the gifts or the promises that God has given to us. And we take on this, well, if it's going to be, it's up to me kind of attitude. And I have to do things in order for this to be accomplished. And, and that's a functional atheism when we say we don't believe that God will do what he has promised to do. So how do I prevent that from happening? How can I let God be my shepherd? And, and the thing is that God is not the shepherd of everybody. 
He's only the shepherd of those who let him be the shepherd. So the first thing is, we need to accept him as Jesus as my Lord. Because the very first set, verse says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord can't be your shepherd until the shepherd is your Lord. We have to make him and, and accept him as our Lord. And in order for us to do that, we have to stop playing God and let God be God. So what does that mean, to be Lord? Well, it means that He is in control. It means that we have to relinquish control of our life and allow Him to be the boss, allow Him to be the CEO, allow Him to call the shots. He is the one that's going to lead our lives. And we're accepting Him to be our Lord. Jesus Christ is only Lord of your life if you allow him to call the shots. If he's not calling the shots in your life, then he's not Lord of your life. And if he's not Lord, then he's not your shepherd either. Because it says, the Lord is my shepherd. So to accept the, Jesus as Lord, it means these three things. In John chapter 10, Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep know me, they listen to my voice, and they follow me. These are the three things, what it means to allow Jesus to be Lord. That you know Jesus, you listen to Jesus, and you follow Jesus. To make him Lord of your life means that you are in obedient step with what he is calling you to, how he is directing your life. This is what it means to make him Lord. And worry is one of those things where we have started to take control in our life. Wor worry is like a warning light. It's helping us be reminded that we are now thinking that we are in control. And, and I'm worrying about this because it's up to me. It's my responsibility. And I have to take more charge than I can really feasibly do. Because God is the one that is in control. He is the one that is in Lord. He is the Lord. And so when we worry, it means that we are taking that authority back. And we're trying to be more than what we should be. So who's in control of your life? Because we actually do have a choice. God does not force us to be subservient to Him and for Him to be Lord of our lives. He gives us a choice so we can be Lord or He can be Lord of our lives. And, and we can't have it both ways. God does not co-pilot, by the way. Because what happens is that we'll crash and then we'll blame Him for doing it. And so we have to allow Him to be completely in charge of our life. He's the one that knows us the best. He's the one that has the power to actually do something about it. So if you are in control of your life, then you're just playing God. And playing God is the root of worry. That's what's happening when we are worrying. And eventually you're going to crash. So if you're running your own life without God's direction, then you ought to be worried. If you're in control, you ought to be worried. But if God is in control, there is no need for you to worry. Because He is Lord. So the second thing that we need to do is to begin praying about everything. Begin praying about everything. Just talk to God about all the things that you are, are dealing with, things in your life. He you said, what? You, are you saying you don't have time for prayer? Do you have time to worry? If you have time to worry, you have time to pray. And God doesn't want us to just come with Him. Sometimes we get to thinking that, that we only need to talk to God about religious things, you know, things that we think that only God wants to hear. But God loves us and He cares about us, what we're going through. Talk to Him about everything. If it's, if it's big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough for you to bring it to God in prayer. And so, God's ability is greater than our anxiety. It says in 1 Peter 5, it says, Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. We are casting it, which means that we unload it. It means that we, we cast it, we let it go. And, and, and it says really to drop it or to unload it. The problem is that we sometimes think about casting as in fishing. If, you're, if you've ever done some fishing before, you know, cast it and then what do you do? You reel it back in, right? But this is not what it's talking about. We, we are to cast it, unload it, and leave it there. Let it go. 
we cast our worries and leave them with God. I really appreciate that. As uh, you've heard her story, uh, it's only a small portion of her story, of course, but just the, the challenges that she had to go through from abusive relationship to losing her, her daughter and recovering her daughter back again, having to move from country to country, and uh, just some of the stress that she had to endure, but recognizing that her relationship with the Lord is really the, the thing that kept her together and enabled her to walk through all of that. Uh, worry has is, is often been described as, as a fog. You know, when you're driving in really dense fog, you can't see yourself through it, and, and fog just provides this, this uh, illusion of, of where you're going. And, and I read that uh, if you had a really dense fog that covered about seven city blocks and is about 100 feet deep, uh, and you condensed all that moisture, it would fill just one cup of water. And that's really uh, how worry can exaggerate our issues and our problems. Now there's a third thing that you want to do if you want to deal with worry, and that is to consider one day at a time. To focus and consider one day at a time. Matthew 6, verse 34 says, So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. In other words, don't bring your umbrella and, or don't open your umbrella until it starts raining. Today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. And when you worry, uh, it doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, you can't change the past. You can't control the future. It just makes things worse for you today. So when God promises to be a light for your path, he doesn't promise a 10,000 watt bulb. Right? He doesn't promise that you're going to see miles ahead on your path. He just simply promises that you're going to see a few steps in front of your path. I actually believe that God doesn't do that because we would be overwhelmed if we saw so far in the future. God has given us what we need and how we need it for that time period. And so God in his grace allows us only to see a few steps at a time. Matthew 6 verse 11 says, Give us today our daily bread. Dealing with our worry is a day-to-day -day choice. It's an hour-by-hour -hour choice. It's making uh, a decision for that day. There is no seminar or no book or no pill that you can take that's going to take away your worry. There is no, even a spiritual experience is not going to take away your ability or, or your desire to worry about anything in the future. The antidote to worry is really going to be a daily choice. A choice that you make moment by moment hour by hour, that are you going to make Jesus Lord of your life, or are you going to take that control and be the one that's going to be trying to, take, uh, trying to be Lord of your life? And so the question is, who is in control of your life? Who is the Lord? And so if God is going to take control of your life, then we can deal with uh, any circumstance that comes our way. So when we do that, our worry goes away. And it is replaced with peace and the knowledge that God knows us best and he knows how to deal with us, knows how to help us. Psalm 144 says, Praise the Lord, my rock. He protects me like a strong walled city and he loves me. He is my defender and my savior, my shield and my protection. So the question I want to ask you today is what's got you worried? What is it that you are facing right now that gets your stomach all in knots? What is it that, that keeps you up at night, that causes you to fuss and fume? What is it that you are struggling with right now? God knows what it is that you're going through. And he says this, your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need. And he will give them to you if you give him first place in your life. And, you, and live as he wants you to. And so this is the promise that God has given to us. I want to encourage you to, when you go home today, just open your Bible to Psalm 23. Uh, for many of you, it's going to be uh, uh, something that you've read before, but I want you to look through it again with fresh eyes. And you will see in, in this psalm, in this short psalm, you will see 17 times where the word I, me, or my is listed. And then you'll see 10 times where, where God is, where is mentioned, he or him. 
And so it's a very intensely personal psalm, and it's all about the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. That is the antidote to our worry. It's a relationship with God. That's, this is what it's all about. You don't need religion. Religion is not going to help you to stop worrying. It's the relationship with God that's going to make the difference. And he has called you into this relationship so that you can have this communion, so you can have this opportunity to, to share with him and allow him to be God of your life. And if you've never made that decision, today would be a great time for you to say that. So you may not even understand what this all means, but I'm going to try and understand and, and, and seek this out, what this means, to allow Jesus to be Lord of my life. And he is going to be controlled. He's going to take, call the shots in my life. And for some of you, you've been believers for a long time, but you've been gradually taking back control from God. And you need to recommit yourself and say, No, Lord, you are Lord. I'm going to allow you to have control. Because the Lord is my shepherd, and only he can really help. Let's pray together. <coughs> Dear Jesus, I admit I don't understand it all. But you have promised that you would take care of my needs if only I trust in you. And I realize that worry is this warning light in my life. To, to reveal to me that I am trying to take control back. And I don't want to do that. I want you to be in control of my life. I want you to be my manager. I want you to be my Lord. And I want to know you. I want to listen to you. I want to follow you. And I want you to lead me in the plan that you have for my life. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for your love that is revealed to us every day. And it is this day that we recommit ourselves in trusting in you. In Jesus' name, amen.